Hello everybody. This is part four of our series on motion, energy and gravity. This time we're tackling conservation laws. So when I talk about conservation laws, we're specifically talking about the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum. So we're going to start with uh, momentum. So why do objects move at constant velocity if no forces act on them? Um, and it's because of the conservation of momentum. So basically, if you have um, you know, something moving, unless a force acts on it, its momentum continues to be the same. And even if it interacts with something else, the total momentum of the system remains the same. So if we look here, we've got two pool or snooker balls coming together. The first ball here is moving in this direction. The second ball is stationary. So the first ball has momentum of m times v, where m is the mass of the ball and v is its, its velocity in this direction. The second ball has no momentum because it's not moving. Once they collide, what happens is that the collision means that the first ball stops and the second ball takes all of the momentum. So the total momentum of the system remains m times v. If that second ball is the same mass as the first ball, now it's moving at the same speed the first ball was, it's moving at v. But if this ball is more massive, it will move slower. And if it's less massive, it will move faster. But basically the momentum is given over to the other body. And this actually happens through Newton's third law where the momentum is changed and it's the equal and opposite reaction. So the first ball has a certain amount of momentum. It is, it is giving a force, it is hitting with a force that is basically uh, causing it to stop completely. That is the change in its momentum. And this one is then going to take that force, be hit by that force, and it is going to speed up by and have the same amount of momentum. OK, we also have conservation of angular momentum. Uh, remember, we talked about how there's linear momentum and angular momentum. Angular momentum is now mass times velocity times radius. So re uh, linear momentum is just mass times velocity. Angular momentum is mass times velocity times radius. So you can think of this as being, um, you know, those three quantities multiplied together have to stay the same. Normally, your mass isn't going to change. So if you want to change the speed at which you are spinning, you're going to need to change your radius. And you can think of that in terms of an ice skater. When an ice skater has their arms sticking all the way out, what's happening is that their, arm, their radius is quite large. And so they're going to be moving slowly. But as they pull their arms in, their radius gets smaller. Their mass hasn't changed. So their velocity has to increase in order to conserve angular momentum. The angular momentum stays the same all the time. You can imagine a situation where a skater is spinning, holding onto some uh, big uh, massive bag and then throws it away. And um, that's gonna have an effect on their spin too. Um, now, angular momentum is not going to change unless there is a twisting force. Now, although um, the earth is changing its velocity all the time because it's moving in a circle, it is not being twisted. There is no twisting force as it orbits the sun. And so it's just going to keep spinning on its axis um, and that will continue indefinitely. Uh, the caveat to that is the moon. There are videos about the moon elsewhere on my channel. So what keeps a planet from uh, rotating and orbiting? Well, we just talked about how once it's spinning, it's going to keep spinning unless something else acts on it. Likewise, if it's going in uh, an orbit, it's going to keep moving in that orbit um, unless something else acts on it. Now, when it's very close into the sun, remember the, the orbit of the Earth and all the other planets are not circular. When it's closest into the Earth, it's got to move faster because the R part, so remember it's the radius, distance from the center of gravity, the velocity, and the mass. The mass isn't changing, but the distance to the sun is, and so it's moving fastest here at aphelion, and it's going to slow down as it moves further and further away from the sun until it's moving slowest when it's furthest from the sun, and now it's going to speed up again as it goes around. And so it is the conservation of angular momentum that explains Kepler's second law, which basically showed that 
planets will move fastest when they're closest to the sun and slowest when they're furthest away. So conservation of orbital angular momentum is what keeps a planet uh, orbiting the sun and uh, conservation of rotational angular momentum is what keeps it spinning. Now let's just briefly digress into the center of mass. What do I mean by the center of mass? Well, because of conservation of angular momentum, we have things that are orbiting, they're orbiting the center of mass. So if we consider two stars here, I've got two stars, they're exactly the same mass m. And so the central mass is going to be directly in between. And that means that they are going to both orbit around that point in the middle. But if you have stars that are different masses, here I've got this one is twice the mass of this one. So star one is a mass of 2m, star two is a mass of 1m. And now it means the central mass is going to be closer to the star. So this star is going to do a smaller orbit than this star. If we think about planets, typically you would have that the star is much more massive than the planet. And so now the center of gravity is usually going to be inside the star. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, and so here what we're seeing is this is either a very large planet or a small star companion. So somewhere between this mass of one and two, uh, star one and star two, and the star and planet. And so the center of gravity is in between the star and the other thing that's orbiting. And so you can see here, as you're looking down, they're both orbiting around the center of gravity, the center of mass. And this is what it looks like if you're seeing it from di directly above the orbit. And this is what it would look like if you're seeing it from the side. This is actually how we detect planets around other stars. We can't see the planets directly very easily, but we can watch how the star wobbles. So here for our own solar system, what we have is that this is the center of gravity for the whole of the solar system. It does actually coincide with close to the center of the sun occasionally, but most of the time it's actually outside of the sun. And you can imagine that it's, it's this complicated because you've got eight planets that are all pulling and they're moving at different rates around the sun. And so it's changing all the time exactly where the center of gravity is. OK, so we've talked about how um, things must orbit the center of gravity and conserve angular momentum. Now we're going to talk about conservation of energy. So let's talk about where things get energy from. Energy is what makes matter move. But energy is conserved. And so it can be transferred from one object to another, just like we saw with momentum. And it can convert from one form to another, but it cannot be completely removed from the system. So there are different types of energy. We've got kinetic energy, that's basically things moving. There's radiative energy, that's basically light. So you can imagine, you know, you need a certain amount of energy to make things move. Light contains energy, that's how it can heat things by, um, hit, you know, the sunlight hits the ground and heats it up. And then we also have potential energy. In this case, it's suggesting uh, gasoline or petrol. Um, which is stored chemically. There are other ways of storing energy that we'll get into. So you can change the type. You can transfer from radiative energy to kinetic energy. We'll get into that. Or from potential energy to kinetic energy or the other way around. But you cannot just destroy it or create it. It has to be converted from one form to another. So let's talk about a couple of different types of energy. So thermal energy is a subtype of kinetic energy. Thermal energy is basically how particles move. So if you've got a whole collection of particles, uh, consider a rock, it's made up of atoms, or the air that's made up of molecules, or water that's also made up of molecules. All of those molecules, whether it's in the rock or the air or the um, or, or water, they are moving. Now, the thermal energy is related to temperature, and we're going to get into why, what the difference is as we move along. Um, they're not the same, but they're intimately related. So temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. So if you think about the air in a room, all of the molecules in the air, they are moving in different directions with different speeds. But the average speed that they are moving at is, the, is basically giving you a measure of temperature. The average speed, that's a measure of how much energy they have, that's the temperature. The individual particles are all moving at different speeds, but they will have an average. 
A lower temperature will have a lower average speed. That is, these particles are moving more slowly than if it is hot, they're moving more quickly. So let's just go into temperature scales briefly because the temperature scales that we're most familiar with are not necessarily the ones we use in science. So here I've got the three main ones. I've got Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit. Most Americans are used to thinking in Fahrenheit, um, but actually most of the rest of the world doesn't. Um, and scientists tend to use Kelvin. Let's dig into this a little deeper. Um, so here I've got all three um, scales, Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit. In Fahrenheit, water freezes at 32 degrees and boils at 212. In Celsius, it's zero and 100. And at, in Kelvin, it is 273 and 373. Here you can see the surface of temperature of the sun and the sun's core temperature. So you can see that depending on the scale you're looking at, you're going to use a different number for the temperature. So Fahrenheit is considered quite old fashioned. Now, remember that, you know, the idea that the temperature of freezing water is 32 comes from the idea that, well, actually, we know that temperatures can drop below that. So let's try and keep them positive and the then we've got space for it to be below the freezing point of water, but still, um, still positive in number. Celsius is what most of the rest of the world uses. Um, I can tell you that, you know, growing up in uh, the UK, actually during a time when we were switching from what Americans call English units to metric, um, during the 1980s, it was really all the weather was still in Fahrenheit. Um, and food was still sold in pounds and ounces and uh, all of that, but we did science and metric. But by the time uh, we got to the mid 90s, we'd switched over and, you know, food was sold in kilograms and the weather forecast was told, sold in Celsius. Um, when I talked to my parents, even though they spent more than half their lives being told the weather forecast in Fahrenheit, they now think in Celsius because that's how they hear the weather all the time. Uh, I can usually do the conversion in my head pretty quickly. In Fahrenheit, the human body temperature is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Water freezes at 32 and boils at 212. In Celsius, water freezes at zero and boils at 100. And the human body is about 37 degrees. So in this case, Celsius, the, the scale was set by using water as a way to anchor it. So it was specifically made so that at regular room air pressure, that's the temperature that water freezes at would be zero, and the temperature the water boils at would be 100, and let's just make it 100 divisions in between. So that was how we set up the Celsius scale. Now let's talk about Kelvin briefly. So Kelvin um, uses the absolute zero scale. So basically, this really is a measure of how much energy there is in the gas. So remember, we talked about how at higher temperatures, the atoms or molecules are moving faster. And you go to lower temperatures, they are moving slower. Well, eventually, you're going to get to a temperature where nothing is moving. That is absolute zero. It is the lowest temperature that can possibly be. Everything stops moving. That was the idea. And so in this Kelvin scale, it was basically, let's make it so that we're still using Celsius uh, type divisions but let's set zero to be when nothing is moving. So now water freezes at 273 Kelvin. It boils at 373, it's just 100 more. And remember, the step in, a step in Kelvin is the same as a step in Celsius. So um, that makes it a little bit easier to convert from one to another. OK, so let's do a couple of conversions just for fun. Um, so absolute zero, as I said, that's zero in Kelvin minus 273 in Celsius and minus 460 in Fahrenheit. For water freezing, it's 273 in Kelvin, zero in Celsius and 32 in Fahrenheit. Room temperature, and I'm taking, uh, making this a little um, overly simplified, is 300 Kelvin, which is about 27 degrees C, which is about 80 Fahrenheit. I'd say that's a bit warm for room temperature. Um, and water boils at 373 Kelvin, 100 degrees Celsius and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you do this conversion, you do it by saying that, you know, if you want, temp if you want temperature in Celsius, 
then you're going to have to take the temperature in Fahrenheit, subtract 32, and then multiply by 509. You can do it backwards. So if you've got the temperature in Celsius and you want to get it in Fahrenheit, you do the reverse. If you want to get from Kelvin to Celsius, all you have to do is add 273. Uh, so if you want to get from, uh, sorry, if you want to get to Celsius from Kelvin, um, then you're going to have to subtract 273. So let's say it's 70 degrees outside. Sounds like a nice day to me. Um, we can put in the numbers, just like we have the conversion up here, and we end up with 21 degrees C. So when my parents say that it's 20, 21 degrees it's, uh, outside, it's like, oh, that sounds quite pleasant. And in Kelvin, it's 294, which is a completely unfamiliar number for most people. OK, so now I get to digress into John Madden and A Cold Day on Mars. For those of you who don't know who John Madden is, he is the person for whom Madden is named, uh, a game, a football computer game. Um, John Madden was a football coach. He was a football commentator. And some time ago, he used to be a commentator on Monday Night Football. And this is going back probably 15 years, around the time that Dennis Miller was also doing Monday Night Football. And there was an occasion on which John Madden said something that I uh, just irritated me so much that I had to write a whole slide about it. So let's talk about John Madden and the cold day on Mars. Basically what happened was, you know, Monday Night Football and it's in September and um, there's a game in Arizona in Phoenix and the temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the following week, another September day, the game is in Chicago. And now the temperature is only 40 degrees. And John Madden says, it's half the temperature it was in Arizona last week. This is what annoyed me. And so I wanted to show that that wasn't true. Okay, so why is it true? Why isn't it true? Why is it that the temperature in Chicago is not half the temperature in Arizona? And it's because we have to work in the right units. If you're not working in Kelvin, where zero is absolute zero, where you're actually measuring how fast things are moving, then it's not really quite the same. So let's do our conversion. Let's start with, we've got a day in Arizona that's 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 27 degrees Celsius. And now we're gonna convert that from um, Celsius to Kelvin. So now we have 300 Kelvin. So on that day in Arizona that the football game was going on, it was 300 Kelvin. So half the temperature of that day in Arizona was 150 Kelvin. Now let's convert it back because Kelvin is not very intuitive. If we want to convert it back, we have to subtract 273 to get it into Celsius. So that's minus 123 degrees C. And we have to also convert it back to Fahrenheit. It is nearly 109, minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Just to put that in context, that's a cold day on Mars. The average temperature on Mars is about 210 Kelvin or minus 81 Fahrenheit. So no, it was not half the temperature in Chicago that it was in Arizona. It was only a tiny bit different when you take it on the grander scheme of things. So having digressed to talk about temperature, let's come back to um, the difference between thermal energy and temperature. So as temperature is really a measure of how fast the particles are moving, but the thermal energy is a mixture of both the temperature and how densely packed it is. So let's consider an oven. I've got an oven here, it's at 400 Fahrenheit, which is about 200 um, Celsius. And if I open the oven door, I can stick my hand in and it's not gonna get instantly burned and hurt, right? I can, okay, I don't wanna touch a pan, but as long as I've got something to hold on to it with, I can stick my hand into the oven and it's fine. But if I have a pot of water that is boiling, it's at 212 Fahrenheit or 100 Celsius. Even though the particles are moving much more slowly, because it's now water, it's much, much denser. And so if you put your hand in there, it will do serious damage because it is a mixture of the density and the temperature that gives rise to how much thermal energy there is. And that dictates whether or not you're going to get badly damaged by sticking your hand in it. 
So now let's uh, go into some subtypes of potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is one of them. So you can think of this as being, this is the energy that something has that could turn into kinetic energy because of its height above the ground. So consider a ball that you throw up in the air. It starts off with kinetic energy, you've thrown it up, but it's slowing down and slowing down. It's not losing energy, it's converting kinetic energy to potential energy. Once it gets to the highest point, it has no kinetic energy. It's stopped moving upwards, and now it's going to start coming back downwards. And that downwards is where it's now losing potential energy as it converts it to kinetic energy. So what we have is something that has kinetic energy that is being converted to potential energy, and now potential energy that is being converted to kinetic energy. Similar thing happens out in space when we have enormous gas clouds that collapse. So we have this enormous gas cloud, and at some point it will collapse in on itself under gravity. And so it has a certain amount of potential energy, and as it collapses down under energy, much of that is then converted so that it becomes radiation and thermal energy. So it's a mixture of you are accelerating the particles under, gra under um, gravity, so they're getting faster, so they have more thermal energy. Um, and actually, as they collide, you will also get some radiation, so some light energy as well. Another type of potential energy is, in fact, mass. So um, mass can be converted into energy. It's not so easy to do, but it can. Um, so probably the most famous equation in all of science uh, is E equals mc squared. And what this says is that if you have some mass, you can convert it into energy, and this is how much energy you'll get out. It's the mass you have times the square of the speed of light. Um, and so basically, you don't need very much mass in order to get quite a lot of um, energy out. This is actually what fuels the sun and is what happens in a H-bomb. You are in a H-bomb, you're converting some of the mass that was hydrogen into energy and it leaves behind helium. But that little bit of mass that gets converted, and it's less than 1% of the mass of the hydrogen, it is a lot of energy that comes out, and so it causes destruction. Um, but it can go the other way too. You can spontaneously make particles, matter, mass, from energy, and that's what happens inside of particle accelerators. Okay, so let's finally come to the conservation of energy. We talked about this, you cannot destroy or create energy. It's just shifting from one form to another. And so coming back to here, we've got, uh, we can have something that, you know, potential energy here, the gasoline, we will then convert it into um, kinetic energy by, uh, it's a chemical reaction, but it allows us to then move with a speed. Likewise, we can convert radiative energy into thermal energy as radiation hits, say, a rock, and that rock gets hot. Uh, and again, we've got the ball where we throw the ball up and in the air and it jump, drops back down. It's converting kinetic energy to potential energy and then back to kinetic energy. The total energy in the system has to remain the same, but it can convert from one place to another.